Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bench Talk Live. I'm Amanda Fuller with the Kentucky Academy of Science. It's May 2nd, 2022, and I'm really pleased uh, to present today a program on microplastics. Um, we have been doing these programs since 2020, and we have gotten some, some great speakers. So I'm really excited about our presenters today, and thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, Kentucky Academy of Science, just for a brief introduction, we are a statewide scientific society with about 4,000 members all the way across the Commonwealth. We do a lot of normal scientific society things like we have a journal where people publish research. We have an annual meeting every year um, where people get together and talk about their, their science. That's happening in November uh, 2022 in Moorhead this year. And we also do a lot of things for the general public, some um, things to advance science literacy in Kentucky. So we have a speakers bureau where speakers are available to folks on request on lots of topics. We have this series um, about monthly, which has been a great way to bring science to general audiences. And we've also been doing a lot of policy work in the last couple of years. And the next two topics of the Bench Talk series actually came out of that policy work. So um, I'm excited about this one and next week's program. Um, next week's program is about COVID-19 and actually wastewater monitoring. And of course, um, COVID-19 and public health have been in our state level policy a lot <laughs> for the last couple of sessions. So we're really excited to help elevate um, understanding of, of topics that are that are in public policy arena. Our, our partner in producing these programs is Bench Talk the Week in Science. It's a weekly podcast and radio show that you can find at Forward Radio. I'll put the link in the chat in just a moment. And some of these programs get rebroadcast onto that podcast and radio show. We're really delighted um, with our partners there at Forward Radio who help um, support this program and let us steal their name. <laughs> so that's been really a great partnership. I would encourage you to go check them out and see um, what kinds of things make it onto the radio every week, highlighting Kentucky research. Likewise, all the programs um, that we've presented on Bench Talk over the past couple of years are archived at our website. You can find those there. And you can find also at our website um, some background on our policy work, what was in the session this past season that we were following, um, what do we pay attention to, what are our members really tuned into, and where are we trying to bring science into the public policy debate. So um, we're very excited. I think my colleague Rob Weber just joined us, and he's our communications and policy director. So Rob, if you would just wave hi. Um, Rob is responsible for a lot of our uh, capacity now to do more policy work. And um, we're very excited. This program is one of the ways that we're excited to advance science in, in public policy by helping people learn more about these issues. So I would point you to our website, kyscience.org. You can find out about all the things I just mentioned. And you can also donate to us because we're participating in Kentucky Gives Day and it's actually Kentucky Gives Week. So up until May 10th, we are, um, we are there with our link um, so that people who are interested in supporting our state level science work and advocacy work can support us um, during KY Give. So that's at our website, kyscience.org. So with that, I would like to introduce our first presenter. Idoya Miaza is at the University of Louisville and has done um, a good bit of research on the state of microplastics understanding and is also involved in sea mammal research. And I'm really excited to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us on um, Bench Talk Live. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, I'll share my slide real quick. Can you see? Got it, thank you. Perfect. All right, um, so as Amanda was saying, my name is Idoya, I'm a PhD candidate at the WISE Lab. Um, and although we don't do much um, bench, uh, bench research on microplastics, we have in increased um, um, 
we are very interested in learning about microplastics in wildlife. Um, in our lab, we do marine mammal research. We also do sea turtle and alligator research, specifically looking at metals. But seeing how um, microplastic has been a concern over the past years, we wanted to see what is the the field, uh, where is the field at, at the moment? And in order to do that, we used a more environmental health approach, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Right. So in this presentation, I'm gonna be give an um, overall introduction to microplastics. Um, I'll talk about origin distribution and transportation, specifically on the marine environment. Um, I'll also raise the question whether it is a health concern and what we know about microplastics. Um, I'll discuss a little bit what we learned from our review in uh, using the water environmental health approach. And I'll also discuss what we found in sea turtles, marine mammals, and humans. And I'll finish my presentation talking a little bit about the rigor and how we can improve in uh, data reporting. So of course, we ha I have a lot of wildlife pictures from our whale trips and other field trips. So I'll use them as um, um, slides to introduce what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna be talking about. So first of all, what are microplastics? Um, there is not a well-defined definition, although um, most of the papers agree that are any synthetic solid particle or polymeric matrices with regular or irregular shapes and with sizes ranging one micrometer to five millimeters. Uh, however, I wanna point out that the lower limit is not completely defined. We know that um, um, if they are lower than one micrometers, they are considered nanoplastics. However, that uh, range of lower size microplastics is a little bit controversial and this up to discussion still. Um, they are very complex pollutants and I'll show you why in a minute, but in general plastics, when we talk about macroplastics, uh, they are in general a complex mixture of polymers and they also have added chemicals to make them flexible, durable, to change the color. So it, they are very complex mixtures of pollutants. They are greatly produced. We use them in everyday products. Um, the single use is a very um, a, a huge problem because we produce a lot of waste of plastics. They are cheap, useful, and durable. And I still am highlighting the durable part because we make them durable for our purposes, but then they are gonna just be aware that they are gonna uh, persist on the environment for um, a lifetime. These substances are produced with thousands of different combinations of polymers and different chemicals. So they are very hard to study. And to add a layer of complexity, they also can absorb different toxicants that are in the environment. So they there are potential vectors of different exposures. And they can also interact with biota. Um, they can um, have aggregates of biofilms. And of course, they can um, promote a microbiome niche within the plastic surface. Where are they coming from? We have two major sources. Um, one is the primary source, which is, um, let me get a laser. So the primary sources consider products that already contain microplastics because they were produced for that purpose. And things like toothpaste or skincare products um, contain those plastic beads uh, that can be entered into the environment. The other um, source are secondary um, secondary sources, which are macroplastics. When they get degraded through weathering, uh, they can produce microplastics. Some of those weathering forces are things like photodegradation with UV light, mechanical abrasion, uh, temperature, biological and chemical sources. So we end up with this mixture of very complex microplastics where we have different colors, sizes, um, even shapes too. And when we talk about microplastics, we think about particles, beads, and things like that. But I also want you to realize that we also should include fibers because they are plastic in origin and they are within that size range. And fibers and, and particles might have completely different toxicological profiles and due to the exposure grounds. Probably fibers are more 
predominant in the air because they are easily resistant them. And probably we are uh, going to inhale them easily than fragments, whether it's fragments might be, um, uh, we might be exposed to fragments more through an ingestion exposure, for example. And I also want you to realize that microplastics are not the end fate of plastics. We can still have them going through another weathering um, processes and this can lead to nanoplastics, which then per se can have completely different toxicological profiles um, than microplastics. Some of the uh, characteristics that I'm gonna be talking today are things like shape, color, size, and composition. So we know, now know that microplastics are everywhere. They have been found in the air, in glaciers, in food, in different body uh, masses of uh, water. But in general, it is considered that river runoff is the greatest contributor for marine um, plastic pollution, not only microplastic, but also microplastics. And this makes sense, right? Because in urban areas, we have the highest uh, population density. So we are gonna have more consumption of plastics, production of plastics, and also waste. Also another source of uh, microplastics are the weathering of pneumatic tires on cars. And so we end up with this sink um, of microplastics. However, I just wanna also mentioned that the, the environment is very dynamic and we can have still a lot of different transportation of microplastics throughout the environment. Um, I wanna focus on the marine environment just because to make it simpler, just to um, you know, point out some of the forces that can promote the movement of microplastics to different niches within the marine ecosystem. Um, so first of all, we know that plastics have a lower density, so they are often found floating in the highest, um, in the surface level of the marine ecosystem. However, all microplastics can also reach the coastal areas and they can strand and increase their residence time in those areas. They can also um, be resuspended on the atmosphere, again, through wind, but they can also go through turbulent mixing and end up settling in the bottom of the sea um, where they might um, stay for a little bit there. However, this is not the last step of the transportation. Once they are in the bottom, they can also be resuspended through um, bottom currents. They can also be uh, resuspended through bioturbation or moved into different uh, trophic levels through uh, consumption. They can also form aggregates and they can also absorb different chemicals. And as you might know, with, because it's the most common thing that is uh, talked about, they can be entrapped in jars. So this gives us a perspective that the microplastics are very dynamic. They move across different environments or even within the environment. They can be found in different forms like aggregates. They can be found in different um, mixtures. And so they are very complex to, to study. Now, the big question is, are microplastics a health concern? And I would say yes, or because they have the potential to cause harm. However, we don't specifically know what the effects are in humans, but that doesn't mean that they are not harmful. We know that from cell culture studies and mice studies that they cause um, toxicological effects such as cytotoxicity, immun immunological responses, but why don't we have a clear answer to that question? Why don't we have that um, much information about like what are the specific uh, causes or um, health causes that they, they produce? And this is because they are very complex compounds. They have physical properties. We can um, characterize them by size, shape, color, and particle density. That's what I was talking about. Um, but even for example, if we look at the size for a second, when we are considering microplastics, we just talk that they can go from a micrometer to five millimeters. That's a huge size range. And we have to also consider that the lower range of size can potentially penetrate different diurical membranes and can have a toxicological effect, such as, for example, crossing the blood brain barrier. Whereas bigger particles might not have that ability. So we have to, it's very difficult to um, compartmentalize 
microplastics and studying them in an organized way. To add the layer of complexity, as I was mentioning, they also have chemical properties. So there are uh, different polymers that they are mixed to form um, those specific traits of plastics. We also add polarizers to them. One of the types is chromium. And in our lab, we study hexavalent chromium because it's a human lung carcinogen. So we are adding things like metals to plastics as well. Some of the UV stabilizers of lead, chromium, and other two metals that are known to be quite toxic, flame retardants. And in general, in the environment, they can also absorb different contaminants, such as POPs. So they do have the ability to cause, um, to be hazardous. Now, the question is, if we don't know what specifically they cause, do we know that we are exposed to them? And we have to look first at the three types of routes of exposure. The first one is ingestion. And of course, there has been a lot of discussion with ingestion because we are seeing that fish and our daily use products such as sugar, salt, water, and they contain microplastics. So it is obvious that we are being exposed to microplastics through ingestion. This is just an example uh, showing that in different countries, we have pretty high concentrations of microplastics in tap water. Another route of exposure that has been less discussed is inhalation. But we know that fibers specifically, because they are easily resuspended in the air, we can breathe them in. And we don't really know what are the consequences of having uh, plastics on our lungs. This is actually a um, micro photograph from a uh, human lung, which was the first uh, paper showing that we actually can inhale plastics. And now we're in a phase where we should start um, studying what are the consequences of having plastics there. Then also dermal exposure is another route of exposure. And you may think microplastics cannot enter through the epidermis to our, um, to our system, right? because they are, um, our epidermis is quite thick. However, we have to consider not only the plastic particle per se, but also the things that are attached to it. And we have uh, some epidermal data showing that plastic dust um, has actually shown dermatitis in workers due to the additives that the plastic has. So it's important to know what um, all the exposure routes that we are potentially being exposed to, to understand what are the consequences. Now in our lab, how do we study microplastics? We use a one environmental health approach, and this approach basically understands uh, the interconnectedness of the three health, ecosystem health, human health, and wildlife health as one. So basically this means that if there is a pollutant in the ecosystem, um, probably wildlife and human health is being affected. And if we are studying our wildlife species, if they are being uh, affected by a pollutant, it is very likely that that pollutant is coming from the ecosystem and we are being affected too. So in order to study um, the one environmental health within the microplastics field, first we ask the question, um, what is the exposure that we are being exposed to humans? Now we don't have a lot of data because the samples are very scarce. And we wanted to look what are the best representative animals in the marine ecosystem because that's what we study. And we decided to look at marine mammals and sea turtles for a variety of reasons, uh, but basically because they share the major exposure routes like ingestion, inhalation, and dermal. Um, but also because they are long-lived species and we share trophic chain. So we are very likely being exposed to the same amount of microplastics and the same composition. So we looked at literature to see what the field was, uh, where the field was at the moment. And we, see, uh, we saw that we found five articles for sea turtles, specifically looking at GI tract, gastrointestinal tract. Then we looked at marine mammals and there were 16 articles, both looking at the gastrointestinal tract and feces, and they included a species within um, mysticetes, so baleen whales, odontocetes, uh, tooth whales, um, tooth whales, and pinnipeds. And then for humans, we found 22 articles. However, only three of them 
actually analyzed microplastics on human samples, such as feces and land. The rest of them were looking at cell culture studies. And these are the things that we focused on, concentration, size, shape, color, and polymer type, because they are often reported in the papers. So what did we found on the literature search? Um, in terms of concentration, it really depends on the isolation method. Uh, however, very broadly, marine mammals, specifically odontocetes and pinnipeds, have very high concentrations of microplastics. And these were actually comparable to the levels that we see in humans. Now, just to reiterate, in humans, we only had three papers at the time. So that's very little data to compare with. But so far, they were comparable. For sea turtles, surprisingly, they contain lower levels. Um, and so we try to you know, discuss this a little bit because as you can um, observe here, the ontocities and pinnipeds, they feed off uh, fish. And humans, we feed off higher trophic level as ontocities and pinnipeds, whereas mysticities, baleen whales, they feed off a small fish and krill, and sea turtles feed off jellyfish in a small fish too. So maybe we thought that maybe microplastics could biomagnify the electrophic change. However, the recent um, review publications that have shown that my biomagnification actually does not occur, what it does occur is bioaccumulation within the um, trophic level. So it could be um, that the samples were taken from different eight you know, specimens and that data was not reported on this article. So for the next time, I think that it would be interesting to compare different eight individuals and the composition of the microplastics, the concentration of the microplastics. Then in terms of size, there was not trend observed. Uh, the range of microplastics range from 0.1 to 5 millimeters. However, as you can see, they missed a lot of lower end um, size. And this is basically um, due to a mesh size that they were using. Um, typically, they use a 300 micrometer mesh size. So that means that anything lower than that, they are not going to be able to isolate. Um, then in terms of shape, it was very interesting that in the GI tract of sea turtles and marine mammals, they contained more fibers compared to my, uh, fragments of beans. Um, however, on the fecal samples of pinnipeds and humans, we could see a higher proportion of fragments. So we are thinking whether it would be interesting to see whether the fibers have a higher retention time on the a gastrointestinal tract, whether fragments can be expelled a little bit easier. Um, and if that's the case, then fibers would be um, very interesting to do research on because they might pose an even greater um, health hazard if they have a higher retention time. Um, in terms of color, blue, black, green, and white were preferentially found, which is not surprising because the same colors are often found in the marine sediment. Um, blue and black are very frequent in fishing gear and containers um, used in boats. And there's a lot of discussion about how like sea turtles might be ingesting white or transparent plastic intentionally because they mimic jellyfish. Um, however, in terms of microplastics, that, that trend has not been completely uh, proven. Um, and also it is very difficult because we don't really know, uh, if we study the GI tract, for example, we don't know if a microplastic that is on the GI tract um, was ingested as a microplastic or was, was degraded during the digestion process and turned into a microplastic, but it was actually a macroplastic what was ingested. Um, uh, in terms of polymer type, polyethylene and propoly uh, polypropylene were the most abundant ones. And again, it's not surprising because they are the most frequently found in ma marine sediments and water column. Um, they also very uh, low densities, so they are bi very bioavailable because they float on the water column. Um, and they are extensively used in single-use packaging, in fishing gear, and um, so on. 
and we could conclude the wildlife and humans to the same polymer profiles, but again, the human data is very scarce, was very scarce at the moment that we did them. Um, but the same profile was observed to be the most common in drinking water. So probably humans are being um, exposed to the same profile through ingestion. Uh, this is just an example uh, to show you what the two main polymer types that we found are used for. So polyethylene is commonly used for plastic bags, storage containers, and so on. And polypropylene uh, is used, again, in bottle caps, gear, and so on. And as you can see in the right-hand side, this is a graph showing that in marine um, debris, uh, these two microplastic polymer types are the most frequently found. So it makes sense that is um, that we found that they were uh, most abundant in uh, marine mammals and sea turtles. So what are the health effects of microplastics? Um, there is not a lot of data because again, it's very hard to understand microplastics as a whole. We can break them down into one factor at a time. We can look at the plastic per se or the additives per se but it's very hard to understand the mixtures. There is some cell culture studies in human cells looking that they have a lot of toxicological endpoints um, uh, altered um, when we expose them with microplastics, such as um, you know, cytotoxicity, oxidative stress, and things like that. Um, mice studies have shown that it reduces um, male fertility, and you know, there is, uh, more and more research going on, but still I feel like there is a lot to, to do. And so what, are, what do we learn? What did we learn in our lab about reporting data? So we really learned a lot uh, looking at different um, articles because I feel like different labs have different protocols. There is not a very uniform way to do research on microplastics. So for example, in sample preparation, it was very hard to know how much of the EA track the different researchers um, used. So some people use weight to show how much sample they analyzed. Other people use the length of the gun. Um, then in terms of gut content, it was also very hard to understand what, what, like how significant that is or how to extrapolate that data to um, animal like whole body animal. Um, then. then in terms of digestion, um, normally there is a digestion step on the protocols to get rid of all organic material, but different digestions can also lead to destruction of microplastics. So it's very important to um, write down on the methods section what digestion type you are using and what controls you are using to account for that destruction. For the isolation of microplastics, it's also very important to identify what mesh size you want to use because, of course, um, as we were seeing on the articles that we analyzed, they normally use a mesh size of around 300 micrometers, and that means that any size below that they wouldn't be able to identify. Um, and those that size range is actually important because they can uh, they have the potential to cross the epithelium. And if they are small enough, they could even reach the blood brain, brain barrier or even placental tissue. So it's very important to characterize all the range of microplastics or as much as we can. For the characterization of the polymers, um, some, well, most of the articles, um, they didn't characterize the polymer type. Some of them use Rama spectra or VTIR. There are some new um, ways to measure what polymer, what polymer types you have on your um, microplastics. But it's very important to at least use some because um, visual identification might not be enough. Um, and of course, quality control methods is very important for microplastics, especially for fibers, because in the lab environment, in the laboratory, we have a lot of contamination of fibers. There is, they are everywhere. Um, so it's very important to account for that, um, uh, those fibers on the lab by doing uh, blank controls. And um, 
having a method to verify that what you are seeing is actually what you are looking at. And I just wanted to look by discussing the last um, very recent research on um, that found microplastics on human blood. Um, these, uh, and also there is some other um, research articles showing that they were found in placental tissue as well. So those are recent articles that we were not included in our review paper because it was a couple of years ago. Um, but I just wanted to discuss the human blood one because it's very interesting. Um, and it shows that, you know, microplastics can actually cr cross the membrane barrier and enter the systemic, uh, the systemic into the systemic um, blood circulation. Um, and the aim of this, this study was at the beginning to find a method to isolate the particles um, that are bigger than 700 nanometers. So that's quite low. And I feel like they did a good job in um, describing the methods. For the results, um, out of 22 volunteers, they observed that 77% had measured levels of microplastics. And in this case, they used a mass spec um, protocol that gives them a concentration of the polymers. And they do say that the range of microplastics that they were expecting were um, between 700 nanometers, because that's the mesh size that they use, and 5.3 millimeters, that's the needle size that they use. Uh, so they should lay somewhere in between there. And I really liked from this paper that they did um, discuss the route of exposure. Not only they were assuming ingestion, because that's what most of people assume, but I really like that they discuss inhalation, uh, because I think that they should be considered more um, in this field. But still, the questions remain, like what are the toxicological effects of having these plastics in our blood? And what is the final state of these plastics? Like, can we get rid of them through our kidney? Um, or do they stay in the blood? Do they go to other organs? Do they accumulate in other organs? Um, there are some mice studies that have shown that uh, there is presence of microplastics in the other organs, such as kidney and liver. Um, and some either two micrometers or lower that can reach the brain. And I do we are we are running short of time, so if we are getting to the end, that would be great. I yeah. know there's so much here. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no, that's okay. I don't have a clock here. I can't see it, so that's great. Thank you for telling yeah. me. Um, so just to finish, the take-home message of what we learned is that there is a lot of challenges in this field, uh, but to better understand, we need to understand first the human exposure and the toxicological effects of microplastics. And the toxicological profiles of microplastics are complex due to physical chemical properties. So in our lab, we try to tackle what is our exposure. We started with that question. And as we hypothesized, uh, humans wildlife are exposed to the same profile of microplastics um, because we share the same environment. And this is through the one environmental health perspective. Um, and just to reiterate that I think that it's very important to be able to gather meaningful data and to be able to report all the steps in the protocol because without that, we can't really use it in the future. And of course, procedural banks, blanks are extremely important, especially when we are isolating them uh, and we are accounting for um, the contamination in our labs. So I would like to end with all the acknowledgements of my lab, my mentor, uh, Dr. John uh, Weiss, and all our um, financial support from different fundings and my lab mates, and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much. Um, I would say if anybody has a specific question for you, we might have time for one. Otherwise, I would like to maybe wait to the end for more questions just because we are, I'm afraid, going to run in short of time. But if anybody does, feel free to type in the chat something quick or unmute yourself if you'd rather. That was great. Thank you. I'm alarmed and fascinated. <laughs> All right, well, if I'm not seeing or hearing questions, I think let's just go to our next presenter. Um, I'm really excited actually to have two people with us um, from EPA in Cincinnati. 
and we actually got connected with them through a couple different channels. So I know we're talking to the right people because multiple um, colleagues pointed us to both of you. <laughs> so I'm glad that we found you and you're working together and I'm glad that you're here with us. Um, Philip Potter is at EPA Cincinnati and um, Suhail Al Abed is also at EPA Cincinnati. And I'm really excited that both of you are here. Um, Philip, I understand you are taking the lead, but I'm glad, I'm glad you're both with us. So I will yep. turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Al Abed. Um, up until about two years ago, he was actually my boss. And so it still feels odd for me to call him my colleague now, but um, he and I are both here. Uh, I'll be taking the lead on the slides today but he and I are both available for questions afterwards. And at the end of the talk, I'll also put our emails up on the screen if you wanna contact us with questions about anything I speak about today. So let me share my screen really quick. Are the slides showing up for everybody? Awesome, all righty. Let me go to full screen there. Okay, so the title of my talk today is Microplastics in the Environment. And uh, I'm gonna give you a quick little outline here. I'll have a few slides that are kind of introduction to this field, um, but Adoya did a really good job of that. So I think I'll kind of skim through those pretty quickly. Um, the bulk of my talk will be, how do we actually study microplastics in the environment? What kind of tools do we use? And then at the end, I've got a few slides that are kind of just about emerging topics, hot topics in this field. Um, so what are microplastics? There was a really great slide on this we already saw today. So I'll just breeze through this, but basically we've got, um, particles of polymer that are less than five millimeters in size. And um, less than five millimeters, as you get smaller and smaller, there is a fraction you eventually enter where you would change the word microplastic to nanoplastic. And where exactly that size transition occurs is up for debate. Um, uh, Adoya said less than one micron, and I have that on my slide also. I know there are people out there that would disagree with us, but uh, we are in agreement on that, that that transition we think occurs at one, one micron. Um, the breakdown of, or the formation of microplastics comes from the breakdown of macroplastics, and this can occur through both physical or chemical uh, transitions. So where are microplastics? And the short answer is everywhere. Um, air, soil, water, which covers everything that the EPA is interested in, uh, food and drink, and then uh, one of the most recent studies that's really making the rounds is human blood. Um, and you probably have heard this stat, because this one uh, gets repeated in a lot of articles out there. Um, on average, the, a person eats a credit card worth of plastic per week, which is about seven grams. Uh, to be honest, that is um, an underestimate because the study that, that predicted that number or came up with that number used uh, very limited information from the literature on, on microplastics from water, from, from, um, from uh, meats and poultry, things like that. And there's honestly a lot of, of other sources that humans get microplastics from. I'm going to breeze through this one, ecotoxicity. Uh, of course, this is part of the reason the EPA is interested in microplastics. Um, how exactly these microplastics uh, uh, affect aquatic and terrestrial life? There's a couple different categories of research uh, involving microplastics at the EPA. Uh, detection and occurrence, that has to do with you know, where are the microplastics and how do we find them? That is probably the area that I most work in. I'm an analytical chemist, and so my job is measuring things in the environment. Uh, fate and transport has more to do with how do these microplastics change in the environment and where are they going and how are they getting there. Uh, and then, of course, just like I mentioned on the last slide, ecotoxicity. There's a lot of toxicologists that do this work at the EPA, and uh, that is not my area, so I'm not going to get too far into that one. So lab design. This is something we did recently at our building in, in Cincinnati, and um, this, is an this is very important when it comes to microplastic research. Ideally, you would want a, a high level clean room that is uh, purified of all plastic. You don't want plastic around your samples if you're studying microplastics. Um, that is, is very, very difficult. There's plastic everywhere. Getting a lab that would be free of all plastic would be next to impossible. Um, but there are steps you can take to try to limit the plastic in your lab. Um, right off the bat, when we recently designed our microplastic uh, lab at our Cincinnati facility, uh, first thing we wanted was to have separate labs for sample preparation and for analysis. And this helps us prevent cross-contamination of our samples. Um, then we kind of walked through the labs and we started pointing out things that were plastic and saying, okay, get rid of that, get rid of that. Um, so for example, we, we got granite countertops installed because the typical um, countertops in, in chemistry labs are polymer-based. Uh, we replaced all lab coats with pure cotton lab coats. Um, we tried to, to 
have as much glass metal when it comes to sample vessels as possible. And really just, you can almost just walk around the room and just point out all the plastic and say, can we get rid of that? And of course it's impossible to get rid of 100% of it, but, um, oh, I should have been clicking through these as I spoke. Yeah, this gives just some more examples of the, the places where we cut down on the plastic, you know, the, the lab coats, the countertops. Um, we got a commercial grade, uh, almost all stainless steel refrigerator. Of course, there's still a few plastic parts in the refrigerator, but it's as much metal as possible. Uh, metal stools instead of plastic computer chairs, things like that. Uh, here you can get on the left, you can see an image of a lot of our all, almost all metal sample vessels. Um, even these have polymer-based O-rings in them to form a nice watertight seal. Uh, so that gives you an idea of still how difficult it is to eliminate all polymer from your lab. Um, a fume hood that helps filter out airborne polymer particles. Um, and then another, another picture of a, a stainless steel vessel for holding our slides. So how do we sample uh, microplastics in the environment? Uh, there are two methods that we use in our lab. Uh, the first one is called grab samples. Grab sample is called that because that's what it is. You run out and you quickly grab a sample. Uh, it's most typically done with, with some sort of, you know, um, uh, bottle with a top on it. You know, here you can see our all stainless steel versions. If we weren't doing microplastics research, maybe we just run out there with a plastic bottle. But of course, we want to try to eliminate the plastic from our samples. Um, this is good for very quick sampling. Uh, and it's good for sampling small volumes, which for microplastics can sometimes introduce uh, some difficulties. Because if you're working with low concentrations of microplastics, like in water, you may only have one microplastic per liter. Well, if you go and you fill a bottle, uh, that is only maybe 200 milliliters, you might not actually even find a microplastic. So uh, working with small volumes like this can actually be a little more difficult sometimes. So one of our other methods we use is called pump and sieve. So in here, we have a, a stack of sieves. I think we work with about five different sieves stacked up, and each one is a different pore size. So at the top, you may have a pore size of a few millimeters. All the way down to the bottom, the pore size may be a few micrometers. And what you do is you flow water straight from the source. So we might go out to a creek or something like that, put a pump into the creek. You flow the water directly from the source through the stack of sieves, and then it's pre-filtering your sample right there. And you can stand out there and filter as much water as you want. So instead of scooping up a bottle that only holds maybe a quarter of a liter, you can stand out there for an hour and you can filter 100 liters. Uh, so this is a good way of collecting a large volume without actually having to transport 100 liters back to the lab, you're basically processing the sample right there in the field. So sample preparation. Um, of course, in environmental samples, there's a lot of things there that are not microplastic, but will interfere with you measuring the microplastic. You have a lot of organic material. Even if you're not working with it, sediment is already difficult enough, but even with a, a water sample, you may have particulate that's there from, uh, it can be a sand particle, it can be a piece of leaf matter, it can be any other kind of biological material. And you have to get rid of that because that will all interfere with you measuring the microplastics. Um, the typical procedure for this that you might see in the literature uh, uses multiple steps involving oxidation, which helps digest biological matter. Uh, also density separation. Density separation, just like it sounds, it uses the density of the particle to separate out things that are plastic from things that are biological, things that are inorganic matter. And um, also sieving or filtering is also very common. Now, when we use our pump and sieve, we're sieving right there at the source. So that eliminates that from having to be done in the lab. Um, now, because we work mostly with surface waters, we don't typically do a lot of density separation. Um, that's mostly used when you're working with sediments to get rid of a lot of uh, inorganic material. Um, but in surface water, there is a lot of organic material, a lot of biological material. So we do have to have an oxidation step. Um, so here we've got a few images showing you kind of what it looks like when we do this oxidation. On the left, that one that's labeled R3 sample, that is a sample of surface water that nothing's been done to it. It was poured directly out of the sample vessel into an Erlenmeyer. Uh, the next two images show the addition of some reagents to perform what's called a Fenton reaction, which digests biological matter. And then on the right, you can see after the reaction has been completed now. So you can compare the far left image to the far right image and see that it digested. It's a lot less cloudy now. It digested and removed a lot of that biological matter. So once we have a sample that's then been prepared where we've digested the matter, possibly depending on what kind of work we're working with, we may have done a density separation, we may have done sieving or filtering. Now we actually have to measure the microplastics that we have hopefully isolated. 
There are a lot of instrumental techniques out there for studying microplastics. Each one can give you different information. Uh, I've designed this pyramid here. I kind of got the idea based on the food pyramid where the things you're supposed to eat a lot of are at the bottom and they're very common and easy to get. The things you're supposed to have sparingly, like maybe sugar or something is at the top. Um, the analogy kind of falls apart when I go beyond that because this has nothing to do with how much you're supposed to use it, but it more, it more has to do with how common it is, how easily it is to find. Um, the, the very easy to find instruments that are very common in laboratories are at the bottom. The ones that are a little more specialized and more difficult to find and less available are towards the top. Um, and I grouped them also into what types of information they give you. So the instruments that are very common, the ones at the bottom, those might give you less information. They might just tell you, is this thing a microplastic or is it not? Um, as you get to the middle there, you might get more information about, okay, well, how many microplastics are there or what types of polymer are they made up of? Uh, when you get up to the top, you're getting very, very specific information about what, what's happening to the molecule that's inside this microplastic. Is it undergoing some sort of transformation or degradation reaction? Uh, these are very specialized instruments that give very specific information. Uh, now, dead center in the middle of this, you can see LDIR. Uh, this is the instrument I'm going to talk about right now. So this is an instrument that we've established in our laboratory. We've been using it for a little over a year now. Um, now, what this instrument does, it uses infrared light to map out your sample. So different organic molecules will absorb infrared light differently. And this gives you information on what the molecule is. So sending infrared light through a sample and looking at what, is, what absorbs it and what doesn't absorb it uh, will give you information on what, the, what type of organic molecule it is or what type of polymer it is. So what this does is it takes uh, an infrared laser and it basically maps out your sample. It just rasters over the entire sample, um, which in this case is a filter paper. Uh, I think it's about 25 millimeters wide. And um, it looks at where that infrared light is absorbed. And that gives you information on where there is a, a microplastic. So here what you're seeing is three images that the instrument takes. Um, this left one, it's very hard to see what's there because this is just kind of a white filter paper. But there is a little bit of discoloration around the outer ring here. And this is just a visual image of your sample. This is what it would look like to your naked eye. Um, the middle is now that the instrument has taken an IR image. So anywhere you're seeing that kind of blue color, that means something is absorbing infrared light. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a microplastic um, because other things can absorb infrared light. Uh, there may still be some leftover biological matter or other things that are in the sample. Um, now on the right, now the instrument has looked at every spot that it absorbed infrared light and it looks at how did it absorb, what wavelengths did it absorb, and then it matches that to a library of compounds to identify the actual microplastics. So it might first look for things that match up with polyethylene, then it will look for things that match up with polypropylene, and then and, and one by one, and just go down the library of polymers. And everywhere where it has now lit up a sample, or a, a spot, I mean, uh, that means it has identified that as something matching its library of polymers. Uh, when we first got this, the instrument, uh, what we quickly had to do was we had to establish that library. Um, you know, most of the time when you buy instruments like this, they might come with one from the manufacturer, um, but you have to consider that these libraries are typically developed using um, pristine, pure um, examples of the polymer, whereas um, the, the polymer you might find in the environment has undergone some degradation. You know, it's undergone weathering. It's been exposed to UV light, to water, um, and, and uh, elevated temperatures that can kind of degrade the polymer. So first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to get actual plastics into this, into this um, instrument and see if they look the same as what was in the library. All right, so this slide, I'm showing you here, it's a lot of information. It looks like I'm throwing so much at you, but this is just to give you an idea of what types of information this instrument gives us. So you already saw what, what's up here in the top left. You saw this a few slides ago, and this is just giving you an image of where the instrument found something that it is identifying as a, as a polymer, as a microplastic. Uh, and then we can take all that information that it spits out and we can plot it a few different ways. Uh, on the right here, you can see that this is all different on the y-axis, all different types of polymers. And then on the x-axis, it just counts. So in this particular sample, it was saying you have this number of rubber particles, this number of polypropylene, this number of polyethylene. Uh, in the bottom left, now what it's plotting, instead of, um, it's still plotting polymer type on the y-axis, but now the x-axis is area. So we're looking at more size of the particle. So now you're seeing, okay, for the polyethylene, 
they're approximately this size. For the polypropylene, approximately this size. And then the bottom right, what we're seeing, still polymer type on the y-axis, but now we're looking at shape and abundance of that shape. So now we can say, okay, maybe the rubber are more pellet shaped and less fiber shaped. And maybe the polyethylene are the fiber shaped ones. And you can get that kind of information too. Um, okay, this slide kind of delves a little more into identifying shape. Um, the instrument, of course, spits out all these different parameters that we then have to figure out what do they mean and how do we get that, or the actual information we want out of this. Um, there are a lot of different parameters that have to do with the shape in this instrument. And what we did was we wanted to figure out how do we kind of synthesize those different parameters into telling us the shape? Because the instrument, unfortunately, won't just say, oh, this is a fiber. Oh, this is a fragment. Oh, this is a bead. We have to kind of uh, finesse that out of the results. Um, so there are different parameters it has called circularity, solidity, aspect ratio. And what we started to do was take particles of a known shape. So we got some dryer link that we knew was microfibers. We purchased an analytical standard that we knew was microbeads. And we fed these into the instrument and saw what do those parameters look like when we know the shape. And we were able to figure out an algorithm that would take those parameters and tell us the shape. So that's how I got that, that graph that was on the previous slide, um, where it would tell us what type of shape each particle was. So a second uh, instrument type we have in our lab, I don't have an actual image of the instrument here. I should have taken one. Um, we, we've actually only just established this. We, we really aren't up and running with this instrument yet. Um, but this is one of the kind of mm, emerging uh, instrumental methods in the, in the microplastic field. And it's called pyrolysis GCMS, which GCMS is gas chromatography mass spectrometry. If you're familiar with how GCMS works, pyrolysis GCMS is just a front end on the instrument that thermally degrades your sample before it gets analyzed. This is very useful for polymers because polymers are very large molecules that are difficult for some GCMSs to analyze. But if you pyrolyze the polymer first and degrade it into its, into its kind of constituents, you can analyze those on GCMS. And those serve as like a fingerprint for what the polymer actually was. So for example, if you take polystyrene and you pyrolyze it, one of the main things you're gonna get is styrene. Uh, one of the other compounds you're going to get is a dimer of styrene, which just means two styrenes attached to each other. You're also going to get a trimer of styrene, three styrene, styrenes attached to each other. And the ratio of styrene to the dimer to the trimer uh, is a fingerprint for the polystyrene. So you can take an environmental sample, run it through the pyrolysis unit, and then however much of that you get, the, the styrene, the dimer, the trimer, will tell you how much polystyrene you had in your sample to begin with. And the same works for all the other polymers. Every polymer kind of has a fingerprint of what those pyrolysates look like. Uh, here's another slide I just made for a hot topic. Uh, tires, tire particles are very big in literature right now. And this is because there was a paper at the bottom here in 20, beginning of 2021 that linked uh, a molecule that's found in tire rubber to these massive salmon fish kills that were going on in the uh, upper Northwest. Uh, every time there was a big rain event, they would get these big salmon fish kills, and they weren't sure what it was in the stormwater drainage that was affecting it, uh, but they were able to isolate this compound shown on the right that is included in the tire rubber and were able to link that to the fish kills. Um, so, so tire particles in particular are a very hot topic right now. Uh, I'm going to skim through these real quick, just kind of in, in the interest of time. We make our own microplastics in our lab. Um, we make these to use as standards when it comes to method development. So if I want to test out a new way of filtering microplastics maybe from a water sample, um, to test that I need a standard microplastic that I can add to water in a known concentration and test my method. Um, now you can buy uh, micro beads, which are microplastics, but as you can see in the upper right image, these are perfect spheres. These are synthesized in a lab and made to be perfect spheres. Whereas, as you can see in the bottom two images, Real microplastics can be misshapen, asymmetrical fragments, they can be fibers, and those may not uh, behave the same way in a water sample as a bead will. Um, so to, to do this kind of method development, you need um, standards that mimic actual microplastics. We produce these with physical methods. Um, you can see a picture of a blender there. That is a hand blender bought from, I probably bought it from Walmart or Target. That's just the same one you'd have in your kitchen. Uh, the Dremel in the top right, same one you can buy over at Home Depot. And you can use these to blend up um, uh, actual polymer samples and form your own microplastics. And so we do this in our lab to make our own standards. 
Uh, the work we have going forward uh, all has to do, at least with, with what I'm involved in, with investigating the, the fate of microplastics and nanoplastics uh, in specifically urban watersheds. We're gonna branch out eventually, but for now that's our focus. Uh, and if I stated earlier that uh, EPA has a lot of toxicologists working for it. I partner with some of those toxicologists to do environmental health risk assessments. My role in that is producing the standard materials that they use to perform those assessments. Uh, here's a few pictures of, of people in my group. And of course, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Alabed here, who will also assist me if we have any questions. Uh, both our emails are there. Feel free to email us any questions, um, or if there's time still, you uh, can ask us now. Thank you so much. This has been terrific. And if folks have questions, I hope you may put those in the chat um, for our speakers. I know we are getting short of time, but I'm happy to keep people on a couple minutes extra if we're able to. Um, thank you so much, Philip, and thank you, Dr. Alaba, and both of you for being with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. One question I had, which came up in our uh, committee, in our policy group, uh, we, we were looking and thinking about some of the plastics legislation that that we were seeing come up in the in the legislature this year. Some of us were wondering what kind of sampling is being done anywhere in Kentucky. Um, is any sampling being done in the Ohio River, for example? Um, how would that happen? What would that look like? And um, how common is it? you know, like you're saying, your focus is in urban watersheds, like how much sampling is really happening um, in, in urban watersheds like ours here in Louisville, for example? Sure, sure. So um, there's a lot of sampling of the Ohio River for many pollutants. Um, not so much right now for microplastics, although we have a lot of colleagues that do that sampling and who work on, on other, um, other classes of pollutants. And we are discussing with them whether we can start sharing samples um, to do our analysis. Um, unfortunately, for, for many, many pollutants, grab samples are quick and, quick and easy methods for sampling, whereas they're less efficient for microplastics. Microplastics require a little more um, time in the field, a little more equipment than, than most sampling methods. And so um, that does complicate things. It's, it's hard to ask someone who goes out there and dips a bottle in and is done to say, oh, hey, also take this pump for me and my sieves and stand out there for two hours. And it, it, it complicates things. Um, but we are interested in sampling more. Right now, we've, we're sampling more uh, creeks and, and, and uh, wastewater treatment plant influent and effluent in the Cincinnati area. But we, we do want to branch out and look at larger bodies of water. Yeah, my, if, if I might want to add on this too, um, there are, for us in EPA, there is national uh, issues and there is local issues or state issues that is related to the uh, state environmental protection agencies or offices. And uh, to be honest with you, right now, the microplastic is not at the top of the list because there are so many other contamination that we have to deal with. For example, you all heard probably about the PFAS issues uh, in, in water and sludge and so on. So what we're trying to do is actually right now is bringing these issues up, up to the front through this research and through this analysis, but it's gonna come back also to the public that demanding that type of information that will uh, uh, go up the ladder, if you will, for our upper management or EPA um, uh, uh, guidelines offices, like the Office of Water, for example, to put that on a, a certain level of uh, priority. So what, what what Philip and I, we are in the Office of Research and Development. We don't really go that deep in the guide, guidelines. We just trying to emphasize, hey, there is, a, there is an issue. Uh, 
we are developing method to look at those. And uh, you can take that information and then you can escalate it to something like guidelines or perhaps uh, after you finish some of these issues of uh, 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 effects on the environment or on, the, on, on a human health and then expand on those, on those type of information. So it, it, it is a real tricky type between what we do in the research and what comes back into our guidelines, if you will, like you mentioned. Thank you. And that, that actually might be the perfect segue to, to give the floor over to my colleague, Rob Weber, for just a moment, because we, we hired Rob on as our communications and policy director. And what you're describing is really exactly, you know, what, what KAS is trying to do as well. And that's what Rob is kind of leading us in. So Rob, if you just want to say a word about our policy work and um, maybe announce the next program too, which is also related to our policy work. Sure. Well, uh, our policy work this year has focused much on uh, what was going on in the General Assembly session. We have uh, followed legislation and done our best to, to give uh, uh, scientific information to lawmakers as they considered uh, a range of, of issues dealing with uh, health matters, COVID, the environment, um, and in reference to next week's Bench Talk Live, which takes place one week from today at 7 p.m., uh, that meeting is going to focus on uh, surveilling COVID-19, uh, whether we're talking about uh, testing people or testing waste, water, uh, all the ways that we can sort of have an, an early detection system so that communities know as soon as possible um, when COVID is spreading in their area, when, when variants are spreading so that their health departments can respond quickly to those uh, matters. So we'll have uh, two speakers from uh, UofL's Envirome Institute, um, Dr. Rachel Keith, as well as Lauren Anderson to discuss those issues one week from today at 7 p.m. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions? This has been such a fantastic program. I'm excited to put it up on our website uh, as a recording that people can check out afterward as well. All right, well, with that, then I'll close it up and um, I hope we'll be back in touch with all of you experts um, as we move forward with our, with our policy work, because I think this is something that we're gonna see coming up again in in legislation and we want to be educated and we also want to take opportunities to educate our legislators about it so thank you so much for helping us start that process i really appreciate you being with us Thanks and for having us. Uh, yeah hopefully hear you on the radio sometime soon as well thank you very much Bye. thank you